Welcome to the next lecture. What we're going to do here is take a walkthrough of some Alzheimer's disease cases. Let's start with a normal study. So here we see a relatively homogeneous uptake throughout the uh, right and left cerebral hemisphere. We see good definition of the superior parietal lobe gyri. We see relatively good display at the level of the body of the chordate lobes. We see uh, activity within the right and left posterior cingulate gyrus, although there is some loss of uh, definition. And just behind my head, we see the right and left anterior limb of the internal capsule. As we extend down through, we start to see occipital and temporal lobes in this well-positioned brain. We see the uh, right and left posterior uh, cingulate gyre more clearly just before they decussate and enter the medial temporal lobe structures. And then within the uh, occipital temporal lobe, we see uh, a, a nice simple thing to remember, which is that the intensity should be most intense in the medial occipital lobes. Next, highest level of intensity at the lateral occipital lobes, then the lateral temporal lobes, and then the medial temporal lobes. So going from uh, in an anti-clockwise direction. So we look at, if we look at parasagittal imaging, we are going to again note in the parasagittal the uh, intensity extending from occipital to frontal lobes in a, a, a more homogeneous way. And if we look at one of the parasagittal for the medial, uh, in the medial part of the parietal and occipital lobe, we're going to note three regions of intensity. So this is the posterior cingulate gyrus, the parieto occipital sulcus, and the calcarine sulcus. And these should be relatively the same intensity. If there's one more intense than the others, it should be the calcarine sulcus. Between the parieto occipital sulcus and the calcarine sulcus, we have the cuneus, and therefore we have the precuneus, an important region. This should be more intense than the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, just at the level of the sulcus of Rolando, so just anterior to this region. So important regions for us to know are the precuneus and the posterior cingulate gyrus. In the coronal imaging, uh, again, this gives us an overview and we can see that general intensity, the most intense in the occipital, and then grading forward into the frontal intensity. Uh, and what we're going to look at is we, we, this is a good region to check, and especially on the rainbow scale, the intensity within the precuneus levels. And here we're going to compare this level of intensity with the level of intensity just anterior within the medial posterior frontal lobes. So when we look at the coronals, another nice pattern to recognize in the posterior and middle third of the lateral temporal is the epsilon three pattern. So 
So this is an epsilon and a three pattern. So this is the intensity uh, as it projects over the superior middle and inferior temporal lobe gyrus. And we'll come to that again. So you can see on this case that we have reduced activity in the left superior temporal lobe gyrus and relatively comparatively reduced activity seen within the right precuneus region. So this is not a diagnostic pattern, but we would note these things, but we would say that this pattern is not suggestive of the presence of an intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia. So let's have a look again at the normal brain. So we're again noting this uh, homogenous pattern, the relative maintenance of the grey white matter differentiation. So no comparative loss of activity. Here's the posterior uh, cingulate gyrus. Here is the uh, parasagittal imaging. And here I want to show you what I call the Adidas sign. So this is the three stripes. So you can see that there is clear activity within the middle temporal lobe gyrus. The comparator here is the activity within the adjacent frontal lobe gyri. And we see that there may be some minor changes here. So some mild reduction in uh, this side, but relative maintenance on that side. But these are not significant changes. So this is not a pattern of significance. So let's see if we can see any difference in an early Alzheimer's disease case. So this is displayed in exactly the same way. And hopefully you can see, so we take a level just at the level of the body of the chordate nuclei, and hopefully you can see that there is comparatively uh, reduced activity seen within the right and left parietal lobes. This is mild in that the level, the Gyral pattern is maintained, but it is all reduced, and we'll see different severity changes. We also see reduced activity within the right and left posterior cingulate gyrus. The comparator here is the activity within the thalamus. So you can see that the activity within the right and left posterior cingulate gyrus is reduced in compared to the right and left Thalamus. If we have a look in this early disease case on the parasagittal, we are going to look for the uh, middle temporal lobe gyrus, and hopefully you can see that on both sides the middle temporal lobe gyrus is no longer seen. So we have maybe there's a little ghost of it here. So we have parietal lobe changes, temporal lobe changes, posterior cingulate gyrus changes, and precuneus changes in this patient. So here's another view of the uh, mid uh, parasagittal image of one of the hemispheres. And we see reduced activity in the posterior cingulate gyrus and reduced activity seen within the precuneus. So here we're comparing this precuneus region with the region just anterior to it in the medial posterior frontal lobes just anterior to the sulcus of Rolando. So I'm going to argue that this pattern of parietal lobe changes, temporal lobe changes, posterior cingulate 
gyrus changes and precuneus changes is one of the strongest evidence that we have for uh, the presence of Alzheimer's disease and that this is stronger than any clinical assessment and stronger than the presence of amyloid. So here we have two patients displayed in the rainbow scale, uh, both with MMSEs of 28 out of 30. And here I want to just uh, introduce you to my idea that dementia is brain failure. Can we see which patient has brain failure? Can we see which patient is uh, unwell? Yes, we can. Now, using the rainbow scale for reporting uh, can be uh, difficult uh, and can trip you up. So we're going to set the intensity as we've discussed in the previous lectures. And then we're not going to play with that intensity again. And this will help you, but we mustn't start to adjust the intensity of these rainbow scales. I do use these rainbow scales routinely in the MDT and when discussing with clinicians, because getting used to the gray scale can be very difficult. So here we have a clinically difficult case, a young patient with overlying uh, psychiatric problems, are they, uh, but with developing memory problems and do they have uh, a dementing process? So what I'm going to suggest to you, first of all, do they have brain failure? Yes, they do. And what is the pattern that we see? The pattern that we see is one of asymmetric uh, profound changes within the parietal lobe. We also have frontal lobe changes. This is less severe than the parietal lobe changes. We have relative maintenance of the sensory motor cortex. So this, I think, can be an important sign for an intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia. So a patient who has a uh, who has both parietal and frontal lobe changes as part of an intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia has this maintenance of the sensory motor cortex and we see reduced activity in the posterior cingulate gyrus so this is a uh, this is often concordant with the changes in the adjacent parietal lobe uh, in alzheimer's disease and of course notice the asymmetry here as i've suggested to you before asymmetry is a common finding in the early and clinically difficult cases that we should be assessing uh, symmetrical change is much more common in more severe disease so let's show you some uh, pet ct images uh, selected PET CT images on a 58 year old man. His uh, um, MRI reported generalized atrophy and clinical features of early dementia. So, first of all, let's concentrate on the uh, lateral view of the MIP. So, when I teach people how to uh, how to report FDG PET CT, I get them first to uh, review and report the MIP then review and report the axials, and then the sagittals, and then the coronals, and put that as part of their initial composition of the report. What this does is it introduces an internal comparator to when you're viewing the images. So what we can see here is a missing stripe here. So a middle third stripe in the MIP display here. So this missing middle third parietal, temporal and the missing activity within the uh, precuneous region is highly typical of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, at this level we see some maybe some, uh, some mild changes uh, but nothing too dramatic in the superior parietal lobes. As we extend downwards into the uh, looking at the grayscale, looking at the mid parietal regions, we start to see uh, these changes. Now, I would say that this is um, moderate change. So we're 
really seeing reduced activity, but some relative maintenance and some variability in activity. So we see moderate changes in the left parietal. This is more severe. It's now very difficult to see this gyral pattern at all. So now, of course, once you start grading something, mild, moderate, severe, and I do the same, you start saying mild to moderate, moderate to severe. So you may say this is moderate to severe. The reason to do this is because it introduces a level of consistency to your reporting. So just as long as you've got the intensity level correct and uh, and uh, reliable as you report these studies, then when you come back to review them for the MDT or with a clinician, sometimes weeks later, you're still displaying it in the same way and describing it in the same way. So, uh, and uh, we start to see the this moderate diffuse sulcal widening in the uh, CT component. And here is the uh, rainbow scale just to entertain the clinician. As we extend more inferiorly, we start to see uh, parato uh, occipital changes. Lateral occipital lobe changes is quite common in uh, Alzheimer's disease and is not a concern. It's medial occipital lobe changes, which we're going to worry about. But here we can definitely see the changes within both the right and the left posterior cingulate gyrus. So you can see that the right posterior cingulate gyrus in comparison with the right thalamus is reduced and the left posterior cingulate gyrus is reduced but less severely than the right changes. If we look back here, these are the more severe changes that we've seen in the right parietal than the left parietal. So again, this is uh, concordant with, the, with our uh, overall assessment and this is reassuring uh, to us. As we descend into looking at the temporal lobes we've got relative maintenance of activity within the uh, within the medial occipital lobes. Look here's the right and left colliculi showing this good quality study but we're seeing probably more reduced activity within the uh, lateral temporal lobes. The assessment of the lateral temporal lobes is very difficult on the axial. And I'm going to suggest that we always do this by looking at the parasagittal imaging. So here's a parasagittal imaging of the left lobe and you can see that there's a completely missing middle temporal lobe stripe in comparison with the frontal lobe changes. So here we've got lateral temporal lobe changes. As we uh, go into the parasagittal middle uh, cerebral hemisphere, we see both uh, posterior cingulate gyrus change and precuneus change. So we're comparing the posterior cingulate gyrus with the adjacent thalamus, and we're comparing the precuneus region with the uh, adjacent uh, medial posterior frontal lobe. Here's the other uh, parasagittal, so again these more severe changes within the right lobe and then as we go on to the right lobe we see these reduced activity within the uh, medial middle temporal lobe gyrus. So let's have a look now at the corona. So we have maintenance of the activity within the medial occipital lobes. We see this reduced activity within both the uh, right and the left uh, parietal lobe changes. And here we start to see, so here we're seeing an assessment of the uh, precuneus on the coronal, and here's the activity within the more anterior. So this is the medial uh, aspect of the posterior frontal lobe gyri. 
This is the one time on Alzheimer's disease imaging when I think it can be useful to look at the rainbow scale. So you can see that this is red and saturated at this level. And, uh, but here we have reduced activity within the posteriors. And this is a really good check for precuneous activity on routine imaging. So I'm going to stop there. We'll have lots of uh, imaging to look at during the rest of the day. I'm going to put multiple other cases and a much more extended run through and walk through of multiple other cases on the BNMS YouTube and you can review that at your leisure. And I'm sure during the rest of the day we'll have lots of opportunity to go through uh, the uh, methodology that I've tried to propose to you today.